The views expressed by the host of this podcast are not opinion-based or for entertainment purposes. They are actually facts and truth, no matter if other people like it or not. It is the Detroit sports truth, and nothing can ever stop it from being correct. Hey there, Detroit sports fanatics, and welcome to episode 207 of the Detroit Sports Truth on Spreaker, the show that actually gets it right and reveals the truth instead of just being honest with lazy opinions. I'm Taylor Phillips. I'm live from my basement apartment office in the northern outskirts of McBain, Michigan. And with me on Facebook Messenger audio from the state of Georgia, as always, is my co-host, Ed Smith. Thanks so much for being on here with me. How are you? Doing feeling wonderful, Taylor. I've had a chance to uh, get a couple days off from my hectic work schedule, get a chance to relax, rest up, catch up on some of these games, and I'm ready to go for tonight. All right. Well, we we have a, a full plate tonight. Uh, first, we're going to recap the Pistons. Um, uh, continuing the, their five game homestand. Plus, uh, we'll take a look at the standings as well. We'll also uh, talk about uh, Chauncey Billups uh, talking about what the Pistons could have done with Carmelo Anthony. And then we'll go into the Red Wings. Uh, Things don't look good for them, but we'll tell you how when we get to them. Um, And then we will uh, go over the Tigers' uh, spring training schedule schedule uh recap a few of their games a few of their past games uh that they played and um look ahead to the to the next few of them and uh we have a we have an update on daniel norris he has a he has a tight back but we don't know how long he's a, he's going to be out for but uh we'll look into it later on also uh nate burleson convincing uh, 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 Calvin Johnson to come out of retirement and play for the Patriots. The Lions sign the Lions signing uh, Jeremy Curley from the Jets to a one-year deal. And Jim Harbaugh, the head coach of the Michigan Wolverines football team, ripping Ohio State Athletic Director Gene Smith over a tattoo scandal on Twitter. But first, it it's Pistons talk time. Left side line three, and he answers. Well, the Pistons beat the come back and beat the Milwaukee Bucks ninety two ninety one on Andre Drummond's game winning put back with two point one seconds left. Uh. They only scored 15 points in in the first quarter of that game on Monday, but they somehow managed to uh, come back and beat the Bucks to extend their winning streak to three games. Their offense uh, looked a bit shaky uh, the whole way through, but uh, they they managed to hold the Bucks to 91 points. D- did their defense? And um, they managed to come back and um, win it in thrilling fashion. Uh, Contavious Caldwell Pope uh, missed, the, with just a few seconds left, missed missed a long deuce jumper, a long two point jumper, jump shot. But Andre Drummond was there in the lane to uh, tap it back in with two point one seconds left. And then uh, the Pistons, uh, without Kentavious Caldwell Pope, due to illness. Really got their offense going. They they scored almost 70 points in the first half. And they beat the Orlando Magic 118-102. 
in a game where uh, the the Pistons defense went back to uh, not covering the three point arc again. I I, I uh, in that game earlier tonight, I I finally figured out the problem. What what they're doing wrong to allow th- wide open three point shots to go down. They are um, their players are uh, all their players at once. All five of them are gathering, are being are being gathered in are gathering themselves in the lane too many times. And that, and that leaves uh, wide open shooters hit their shots from behind the three point line, and that's and uh, we know three points are are greater than two in terms of math, and uh, that's that's a serious problem in this case. It is a problem, and it, it's a problem that's been bothering them all season, it seems. But luckily, it didn't hurt them this time around because, uh, you know, they gave up a lot of open looks. Orlando only hit 8 of 25 for a low 32% percent, uh, percentage clip. So it didn't necessarily come back to hurt them as it, as it would have in, in games past. Um, likewise here, uh, well, you can't necessarily say that with Milwaukee because even though Milwaukee was much more accurate, they only had nine three attempts. Granted, they, had, they did hit five of those, but you know it was because they, they chose their shot selection very well, as opposed to Orlando that kept jacking it up and jacking it up, hoping something would fall. You know, kind of reminds me of Michigan's basketball team a little bit. Um, but back to Milwaukee, the Milwaukee game first and foremost. Uh, if you want to do some compare and contrast, uh, well, I'll get to that in a little bit. But I, first and foremost. Um, you got to say, it, it, things did not look good for a multitude of reasons. This is a team coming into that game, uh, only had the, the, uh, the Bucks. I'm talking about, they only had nine wins on the road the whole entire season. Um, so you would have thought, okay, this is a very winnable game. They stink away from home. They're in our place. This should be fine. But it wasn't. When you get off, when you let a team like that, uh, outscore you by 13 points in the first quarter. Granted, it did turn around in the second, but still, um, it, they they maintained a double digit lead throughout the majority of that game. And it took a massive comeback ever in the fourth quarter just to put yourself in a position to try and win. Um, he makes you very concerned for like, what is this team's uh, mental leadership or whatever the case may be to allow a team like that essentially punk them? for the first three quarters on their home floor. Luckily, they got together. Maybe Stan Van Gundy said some of them, but in that fourth quarter, you saw a much different team play, different, play better defense, did not give away um, easy looks, uh, was able to get things going on their own terms offensively. Um, and it showed, and sometimes also it helps out when you have a little bit of luck as well. Uh, Jared Bales, Bales of Milwaukee had a chance to ice the game at the free throw line under 10 seconds to go. He missed both free throws. Um, and you know he's got to be kicking himself over that because the Pistons got the rebound, called the timeout, and as you saw what happened, you said Caldwell Pope, he attempted that shot, correct? Um, which led to the Drummond put-back tip-in for essentially the game winner. So it's it's one thing, you know, if I was a coach for a basketball team, I always preach this, please make your free throws, because not only are you giving away free points, uh, you're leaving the door open for another team to possibly cash in and possibly beat you. And that's exactly what happened between, uh, in the case of Milwaukee, very fortunate for the Pistons' sake, but, uh, you know, they, that was a game they should have had in the bag long, long ago, but still. Great job in persevere, and you know, speaking of uh, free throws, you know they're much more accurate, believe it or not, uh, than it was Milwaukee. Obviously, the two big blunders, no ones were the two misses uh, by Bears at the end, but still, fifty-seven percent aligned for Milwaukee compared to seventy-six and a half of Detroit. Vast, vast difference. Um, another thing, another thing, uh, number you got to show over here: the rebound game. We know uh, one of the Pistons' primary strengths is rebounding. Uh, but so is Milwaukee, too. they got two good bigs here. One of them, of course, used to play for Detroit and Grant Monroe, and the Greek freak, otherwise known as uh, Giannis Antetokounmpo. Uh, both those guys 
had double doubles in that game as well. Uh, for it, whereas for Detroit, the only person that had a double double was you guessed it was Andre Drummond. Uh, but it was it was a uh, back and forth game, uh, to say the least. But in terms of rebounds, uh, Milwaukee only, even though they had the overall majority uh, in terms of uh, they outmatched, outnumbered Detroit rather by one. There was one big category that, you, that I think uh, needs pointing out: offensive rebounds. Milwaukee only had five offensive rebounds compared to Detroit's ten. So when you double the number amount of offensive rebounds, that sets yourself up for second chance points. And clearly, as we saw on one of the game's last possessions, that was the case. So uh, a vital win for Detroit, obviously, in terms of keeping their playoff chances alive. Because even though they're creating distance, they were creating t- distance for themselves away from. Like say a team like Washington nipping on their heels, they were still neck and neck with that eighth spot for the Bulls because of due to percentage. They're still on the outside looking in, but luckily, due to what they did tonight um, against the Magic, which which we saw far better uh, defense. You know, the point total may, may not show. It definitely shows in terms when you look at the numbers and the stats. Uh, far lower shooting percentage. I think Orlando had about. 39% uh, from the field as close to well, it's, uh, over 40% as it was from Milwaukee. Uh, probably close to 50. Uh, my memory escapes me at the moment, but still, uh, much difference in terms of allowing uh, the, the, the other the opposing team to score from the field. Uh, great job at Detroit's defense. Already mentioned the, mat, the fact that Orlando jacked up three pointers. That didn't help their cause. And, uh, you know, this has held their own. Conversely, they were 11 or 24, 45% from three. Even better tonight with their free throws, 84% from the line. And uh, as opposed to, you know, seeing your usual two or three of your starting five do all the heavy load, practically everybody else got involved offensively. Uh, obviously, Drummond, who had a big game himself, he had 30 points, his second highest total of the whole season, as opposed to uh, the only uh, game where he scored higher was that uh, unbelievable four-overtime game in Chicago where he scored 33. Uh, right behind him, Tobias Harris, continuing his usual trend, always getting you at least 17, 18, nine, sometimes 19 to 20 points a game. Had another self-18 uh, 18, 18 spot today. Um, and, you know, seeing other players, uh, Marcus Morris for once, coming out a bit of, of his own little slump, he provided with 13 points. Uh, your backcourt, Reggie Jackson was 16 uh, and uh, Darren Hillard stepping in for the uh, uh, out of the lineup. Kate was called while Pope did the injury. Hillard was able to contribute with 11 points. And speaking of production and contributing, how about our bench? You know, uh, their second unit, whether it be Stanley Johnson or Aaron Baines. Um, what you saw from Johnson and Baines tonight combined 26 points from them off the bench. Baines, this go, goes along with the performance he had. Uh, a few games ago against the Kings, where he had 21 points and seven rebounds. So, very nice job to see, you know, where it be some nights it's Baines, other nights Johnson, or even some some cases it's even Steve Blake of all people. Very nice to see your second unit finally seen, starting to show some, some cohesiveness and uh, continuity uh, in terms of giving you production, needed production, uh, as we... Uh, head close to the end of the regular season. So, and not to mention the big, big factor of all, um, not only did the Pistons win tonight, but finally for once, the Bulls lost. So thank you to the New York Knicks. Uh, with that loss, their 115-107 defeat at the hands of the Knicks yeah. at home, as seen on ESPN, the Pistons now finally are back in the number eight spot. They have sole possession of eight place uh, in the Eastern Conference. Uh, and believe it or not, in terms of... Uh, games back record and percentage points well record wise they're essentially tied uh with the indiana pacers yeah. uh in terms of the games back margin from from the first place cleveland cavaliers both teams are tied at 13 and a half but only cleveland i'm excuse me excuse me not cleveland but indiana they have a slightly and i do mean slightly higher uh winning percentage point so if thing yeah and uh the pistons and pacers are uh, both three and a half back of the Hornets and the Miami Heat. The Hornets and Heat are 10 games flat back of the Cavaliers. They both stand at 41 and 30. Pacers 37, 33. Pistons 38 and 34. The Bulls 36 and 34 with that loss Wednesday night. Thankfully, 
um, it, 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 it's been almost, it's been almost a decade now since the Pistons have not reached, since the Pistons have reached a playoff spot. 2009 was the last time they, uh, they, they, uh, they reached a playoff spot. This is, this is, this, this may go on like seven or eight years if, if the Pistons fail yet again, but, uh, the Pistons uh, have have won four in a row. They're they're red hot, and uh, the last time the Pistons and Hornets met was in Charlotte at Time Warner Cable Arena. The Charlotte Hornets destroyed the Pistons. The Pistons uh, uh, um, know that it's a fluke, and we know it too. I wouldn't necessarily call that a fluke because, like you mentioned, with, with, with that, with that was no fluke. Actually, actually, that was a very poor, that was a yeah, very poor performance, a rather. Yeah, massive, massive improvement. Yeah, a, a poor performance against a team that really has has shown themselves to be quite an improvement over years past. Um, you know, back when you were uh, before they became the Hornets again, they were known as the Bobcats. They were essentially the doormat uh, of the Eastern Conference, that and the Philadelphia 76ers. But now, you know, maybe it was the addition of Lance Stevenson that might have helped too, as well as the uh, the evolved game of Kemba Walker and even uh, bench work from Jeremy Lin of all people. You're seeing the Charlotte Hornets now becoming potentially now a playoff team. Um, the record speaks for itself. They got some good wins, get some good teams. I mean, for goodness' sake, was it the other night they beat the Spurs of all teams? And that was a Spurs team that had just come off mm. a massive win against. Uh, possibly the best basketball team in the world right now in, in the Golden State Warriors. So if that Hornets team could beat that Spurs team, you know, you possibly, I would, I would possibly list them as, as a, as a dark horse candidate uh, to possibly make some noise uh, in this year's playoffs, depending on what their matchup goes and how far they may go. Pistons also play Saturday against the Atlanta Hawks. And, and then they get, those last two games to go against the Oklahoma City Thunder and the Dallas Mavericks. They play the Thunder on Tuesday and the Mavericks next Friday on April Fool's Day before they uh, head to Chicago on uh, Saturday, April the 2nd and play the Bulls at 8. Another um, another uh, key matchup there f- for the 8th uh, and final spot in the playoff picture in the Eastern Conference. But um, the the Pistons uh, are uh, looking for some revenge against the Hornets and the Atlanta Hawks, but um, they they just have to perform better against those two teams, and then they also have to perform better against the Thunder, and then they and then they uh, have an objective to sweep the Dallas Mavericks in the season series. They. They beat the Dallas Mavericks in Dallas at American Airlines Center in Dallas like three three or four weeks ago, like three weeks ago, 102 to 96. And, and um, Andre Drummond scored 20 points in the, in the first half of that game, which was uh, probably a tie for a record uh, or maybe a new record, actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was a new record uh, for any NBA player to to reach twenty points in one half. So, so some big key games, yeah. like you mentioned before. I was, was going to say some big key games, like you mentioned before. Uh, whether it be the maps again, or even you know the potential tough series, tough game, tough matchup against the Thunder. Of course, that last match against the Bulls, uh, their final had to tilt, which could determine uh, what's all said and done, who gets that eighth spot in the East. And also this match against against the Hawks, because remember the last time they faced them, only well, different, you know, it was an eight-point loss, uh, not an eight-point, but a four-point loss. Um, so the Pistons can really learn from their mistakes there. Just, if, 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 if just try to quiet down the three, because I had sunk 12 three-pointers. Uh, so that's a team, of course, that can shoot three. 
but you got Jeff T, Kyle Korver, uh, among others. And, of course, you know, uh, as Michigan fans will know, they got Tim Hardaway Jr. on the, on the squad now. So Timmy could hit a, a shot from deep if, if, if he saw fit. So that's really one big key that Atlanta, I mean, that, that Detroit has to worry about and try to limit the damage as much as they can against Atlanta. Quiet the three, take care of business in the paint, don't get into foul trouble. And uh, you could you could play as much of a tight game as you did against against the Hawks like you did last time, and hopefully you'll come away with a win this time. What I would suggest for the Pistons' defense to do is to uh, form zones better, uh, form zones more, like a two-three zone or a three-two zone. Uh, it, it depends on um, how many how many players the opposing team. It depends on how many players that the opposing team is um, setting up behind the three-point line and how many players the opposing team is setting up uh, near the near the baselines or in the lane and things like that. I, I think I think if you gather I think if you're, if you're get if your players gather uh, too much, like I mentioned before in this in this episode, if they if they gather too much. Like in the lane or at the at the free throw or at the at the three point line, chances are the the opposing team is going to be left wide open at at the other area of the floor in the up in in the offensive territory. And the Pistons aren't playing zone yeah, too many it, it's times. It's going to come down to yeah. It it really comes down to players on the defensive side of things. Rotating well, not getting all traffic, and whatever player that they're nearby, they cannot give them open space. Those are, those are simple fundamentals they have to work on in terms of uh, producing a better defense against three point shot. Right, and um, another another uh, key tip for the Pistons defense to take is uh, don't let the opposing offense lure lure all your players into the lane and. To, to leave an, another uh, opposing player wide open from three point range, for example, that's that's what uh, the that's what I've seen the Magic do at least a few times, maybe about ten times or so, and uh, that's very irritating to me. The Pistons, uh, if the Pistons have have to have to stick with with their uh, zone. They have to be patient and wait for. Um, Wait for other players to get out, get outside in three-point range, so they can cover them too, and uh, and so on and so forth. That that way, your defense will will do better statistically and not just performing performance-wise on on the floor. So with that, we transition to the other piston topic. And Rashid from long range. Oh! Yes! 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 Oh! yes! Yes! Former 2004 NBA Finals MVP and former piston NBA champion Chauncey Billups. Uh, uh, an an analyst, a studio analyst for NBA on ESPN, was was saying, according to a source, "What if Mello went to Detroit? Quote: We probably would have had three NBA championships." Unquote. This source comes from Detroit Sports Nation published by Ryan Van Dusen. And uh, we have a and I have a text message uh from 7343412543. I believe that's Miguel Lacuda chiming in from from the Detroit Sports Rag group. 
The pistons are horrible, just like Morazic. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, maybe either Miguel Locuto, Locuto or Brian Kavanaugh. One of those two. <laughs> but uh, th thank you for the text message, uh, either Miguel or Brian. Much appreciated. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Morazic, uh, still the number one goaltender f for the Detroit Red Wings, as everybody else knows. Uh, this 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 is only, probably a, is only a joke text or something like that. Um, anyway, p anyway, the source reads: people people are still asking, despite being over twelve years removed. Quote: What if the Pistons had used their number two pick in two thousand three to draft Carmelo Anthony instead of Darko Milicic? Unquote. Uh, most recently, the debate has briefly sprung back to life on the heels of Bleacher Report journalist Howard Beck's thorough deconstruction of Anthony's career-long friendship with LeBron James. Predictably, the con controversial happenings of the 2003 draft creep back to the forefront when Detroit opted to bypass on the star freshman coming off a championship season at Syracuse in favor of of a seven-foot prodigy out of Serbia. And here's what it reads. What if Anthony, who was later mentioned by Billups in Denver and Rashid Wallace in New York, had the benefit of their veteran wisdom from day one? As teammates over the years will attest, Anthony has always been in his best when paired with a strong point guard and seasoned veterans. And Carmel Anthony said, quote, that's why I was a little bit disappointed. This, uh, because I really wanted to go to Detroit. You had Chauncey, you had all those guys over there. Detroit, they had something going up over there, unquote. That, those are, those are the words from uh, Howard Beck of uh, Bleacher Report. Back, back to the uh, Detroit Sports Nation article by uh, Ryan Van Dusen. Typically, there's been two schools of thought on the notion of Anthony ending up in Detroit. One on hand, there's a faction that believes Anthony's star power and skill set would have melded well, melded well with a budding East, with a budding Eastern Conference superpower, perhaps turning one championship into a plural endeavor. On the other hand, there have been many. Yeah, I just got a tech, another text from uh, Brian Kavanaugh that, that this this is a different number. Uh 734-306-68-6854. P Tech Justin P Tech misrepresented me. This is B Cav, Brian Kavanaugh. I love Howard. He needs to play. Pistons are bad. Please stop lying on this truth cast. Possibly can too. It's uh, clear, it's been very clear that you know he's lost a step or so. And Peter Morazic, Peter Morazic, despite what you could say, he's how he's performed. You know, as of late, he's been by far the best goaltender, the better goaltender, which were this season. It's nothing to take away from Jimmy, even though he's had some bad. Stuff. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, I, I uh, Brian Kavanaugh is not even getting it. Howard got pulled, and uh, after uh, getting scored on three times by the Lightning early in the first period, Brian Kavanaugh. So please don't. Um, you know. Please don't give me any more BS. Don't worry, 
we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Yeah, we'll get to that. Yeah. Wow, we'll just, we just gotta get back. We'll get to that trap scene a little bit. We just gotta get back to the topic at hand regarding this article. It seems. Yep. On one hand. There's there, there's a faction that believes Anthony's star power continuing on here and skill set would have melded well with a budding Eastern Conference superpower, perhaps turning one championship into a plural endeavor. On the other hand, there have been many who believe that Anthony's longstanding isocentric defense secondary approach, who would have been at odds with Pistons head coach Larry Brown and the team's defining ethos. Do the Pistons still trade for Rasheed Wallace with Anthony in tow? Does does Tayshawn Prince suddenly become expendable on the heels of Anthony's budding stardom? Do the Pistons still grind their way through Indiana in the 2004 Conference Finals? Would Larry Brown have limited Carmelo's role on account of his youth, eventually leading to his departure at the end of his rookie deal? It's not that complicated. It's not that complicated, according to former Pistons point guard and 2004 Finals MVP Chauncey Billups, who said, quote, that ball-stopping mentality that Carmelo has, he wouldn't have had that if he was a, if he was a Piston. We wouldn't let him play that, like that. He would have been a much better player that, than he is now, and he's a great player now. This guy would have been. He would have been an absolute icon because winning take winning takes you there. Unquote. The gears keep the gears keep turning in Billups's head, and the alternative and the and the alternate endings keep unfurling. And he said, "Quote: Who knows? Who even knows if LeBron would have ever gotten through us? We probably would have had three championships." What would LeBron have been at this point? Great player, but what? Great player, but at what point would he have been able to get through the Pistons if Carmelo had the supporting cast of us of this team? Unquote. Back to Van Dusen's take here. As it stands, the Pistons made six consecutive trips trips to the Eastern Conference trips to the Eastern Conference Finals during the 2000s, winning an NBA championship in 2004 against the Los Angeles Lakers and falling a quarter shy of winning back-to-back titles the following season in a seven-game loss to the San Antonio Spurs. Would Anthony have fit within the Pistons system with the influence of Detroit's veteran leadership have been as effective as Billups contends? Is there such a thing as having too much talent when it comes to competing to completing the delicate balance that comes with a creative with creating a championship contender con, creating a championship contender a contender these are all questions that shall forever remain unanswered in the meantime anthony remains two rings behind his primary contemporary james and once again he's one behind darko so ed uh, Chauncey, in this Van Dusen source, is, is comparing how great Carmelo Anthony could have been if he were with the Pistons to LeBron James when he was with the Cavaliers in the 2000s. And he's saying that the Pistons... Um, that... Um, Sorry, P Tech, but the but these articles are but uh uh th- these articles here are um uh well well uh, they they're maybe they may be interesting but uh we'll 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 we'll, we'll try to figure this out okay Justin bear with us uh Ed uh. Would would it have been okay if uh, well well we we have uh, Carmelo Anthony here uh, Chauncey Billups's comparison if if he would have uh, 
if the Pistons would have used the number two pick in 2003, Carmelo Anthony, and instead of Darko Milicic, he said they would have been better. That that uh, Dar- Darko Milicic uh, was only a reserve bench player. He didn't score very many points for the Pistons uh, through o- from 04 through 06 or 07. Yeah, Darko was basically as big as a liability as you ever saw a person, uh, saw a player, you know, high drive, high draft pick, which notwithstanding. Um, I guess you can make some comparisons in a way, in a sense, to, you know, should the Portland Trailblazers have drafted Michael Jordan instead of drafting Sam Bowie, as the Bulls would do with the very next pick. So I guess you could find that parallel comparison uh, to this day and age as it was back then. But, you know, I think you could have drafted anybody else than Darko, <laughs> quite frankly, because let's not forget who else was in that draft. You also had a guy by the name of Dwayne Wade. You also had a guy by the name of Chris Bosh. I think I would have loved to have taken one of those two guys. Um, yeah, as opposed to Darko. Um, and it will possibly put us in a spot where, you know, hey, maybe Detroit would have a couple more rings than the, than the lone one they had in 04. You know, you could have seen a young Dwayne Wade uh, on the bench, learning what he needed to do, and once Rip Hamilton's time came away, came and went, uh, Wade would firmly plant his stamp. Or, or, or another course match would be with Chris Bosch. You know, uh, you would probably, you know, even though he might have been, you know, still would be a young player, you would call upon him to help lead your team in the wake of if and when Ben Wallace still, still would have chose to leave for, for greener pastures and a bigger check. In Chicago, you would have you still you would have filled in that spot. Uh, some instance, you know, to a sense degree, with Bosch, uh, not only with his size, but also because he was taller than Wallace, he could also shoot better, better free throw shooter, better shooter overall with his mid range and long range game. So, I think of those possibilities, not nest, not only primarily uh, the Carmelo uh, aspect, but. Um, it makes you wonder if, if if Carmelo was on the team, would it make Tayshawn more expendable? I would say you would have used Tayshawn more as a uh, productive bench player. Um, I don't see anything wrong with that. You could have used him as a bit of an X factor, so to speak, because Tayshawn in his prime, but that long wingspan uh, would have been able to make clutch plays defensively, as we saw that block on Reggie Miller. So you would have used utilized him in a key role if you needed key uh, key defensive stops late in games. That's where Tayshawn would come into play. Um, whereas also conversely with Carmelo, playing under the right, playing under Larry Brown to start his career and being around a team and atmosphere that focused or relied on getting everyone else involved as much as possible and especially defense, I think you would have seen a much different Carmelo Anthony than the player you saw today. The offensive skill still would have been there. It's always been there. It would have always still been there. But I think if you had him, under a team and with a coach like the Pistons and a coach like Larry Brown, uh, you would have seen psychologically and in terms of overall all-around game a much different Carmelo than what we saw today. And it possibly could have made huge dividends in winning Detroit a couple more championships. Yeah, I agree. I, I And uh, we will uh, use that as one of the five questions uh, at the end of this episode. But yeah, uh, Carmelo Anthony could have been uh, a better team player with Detroit. Could have helped uh, the Pistons uh, win at le- win at least two championships, maybe three. At least get back to the finals once more. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So with that, the the uh, topic you've all been waiting for, the Red Wings. <laughs> The Red Wings uh, con- uh, conclude their four-game road trip with a 6-2 defeat, drumming rather, at the hands of the Tampa Bay Lightning at Amelie R- Arena in St. Petersburg Tuesday night. Jimmy Coward Howard got chased 
after giving up three quick goals early in the first period. Still, which which proves that he's still not a number one goaltender, or and uh, he's uh, not really a good backup goaltender either. Consider it, his uh, red his uh, red hotness had been uh, short lived, I guess. He's uh, back to he's uh, statistically he uh, gave up four goals. That, in his last uh, game, after after uh, giving up only one goal against the Blue Jacket, it's because uh, Columbus stinks. Basically, uh, that he gave up three goals actually in in Sunrise, Florida, to the Lightning uh, to the Panthers rather before giving up three quick ones to the Tampa Bay Lightning. As I already mentioned. Uh, Pina Morazic played the rest of the game and gave up three goals himself, but but he played more ice time than Jimmy Howard did, and uh, Morazic stopped more shots than than Jimmy Howard did as well. Uh, Morazic was okay, but but uh, Jeff Blaschel, that moron, decided to start Jimmy Howard instead, just only for for. Uh, for uh, for a precautionary reason, but um, of course we knew Howard was going to get drilled by by this explosive lightning offense, and uh, all all Red Wing fans saw it unfold. And um, comes come off season time, it's time to trade Howard, the coward. So, Ed, uh, the Red Wings are tied with the Philadelphia Flyers for 83 points. The Flyers own the tiebreaker for the second wildcard spot in the Eastern Conference standings. That that was uh, right after the Philadelphia Flyers blew a 2-0 lead late in the third period in Columbus and lost in a shootout in Five rounds, apparently. Yeah, yeah, five rounds. When uh, Boone... yeah, that's the only thing that, that kept the Detroit in this uh, in this race so far. That last wild card spot, because remember, um, yeah, the even though the Flyers own the tiebreaker, mm-hmm, through that head-to-head matchup that they won on the fifteenth of this month. Um, so, in light, pardon the pun, of that dismantling. From Tampa, you know, this is a prime opportunity. Oh, geez. Yeah, I just got a call. Yeah, sorry about that. I just got a call from uh, somebody. Yeah, it was just, you know, quite uh, astounding, like how Philly had a a, a two-goal lead. And literally within the last two minutes, they gave it away, and they wind up losing in a shootout. Uh, if they miss the playoffs, they can point directly to that game as the reason why. Yeah, that's true. But, um... The Red Wings, uh... Are done with their four-game road trip. They they return home. They play the struggling Montreal Canadiens with their uh, number one goaltender Carey Price being out for the season, and PK Subban being out for the season as well. And uh, whoever's calling in with no caller ID uh, at, at at better stop. I could. Uh, I could. Uh, I'm I'm in the middle of a conversation with Ed Ed Smith here. Yeah, yeah, I can tell it's it's Brian Kavanaugh. I can I can have Justin Spiro uh, suspend you for even longer than thirty days, Brian Kavanaugh. I can tell you that right now. 
Don't even don't even start with us. But anyway, Canadians are uh, in 13th place out of the 16 teams in the East. 74 points, 34, 34, and 6. The Red Wings uh, analytically should should beat the Canadians in terms of uh, where each of those two teams are in the standings. The Red Wings stand at 36, 26, and 11. The Flyers, 35, 24, and 13. The Red Wings have more regulation losses than the Flyers. The Flyers have more overtime losses than the Red Wings, 13-11. Plus, the goal differential, Flyers minus 5, the Red Wings minus 10. Okay, Brian Kavanaugh, that's it. I, I'm going to get Justin Spear on the line right now. Yeah, the Red Wings minus 10, the Philadelphia Flyers minus 5. I'm going to message Justin Spear right now. Hold on a minute. But um, anyway, let me uh, uh, let me do something real quick. All right, just one more thing here. Whoop. All right, back to business. Back to business here. Uh, Red Wings and Canadians. Uh, let me look at the rest of the schedule here. Not very many games left. I believe they play on Saturday. Is that right? Yeah, at home against the Penguins at 2 o'clock. And then on Monday, they host the Buffalo Sabres. It's a a short three-game homestand. Monday at 7.30 on Fox Sports Detroit or NBCSN. Probably want to tune to NBCSN anyway. Then on Tuesday, they're in Montreal to wrap up March at 7.30 against the Habs. The Pittsburgh Penguins are in third place right now at 88 points with, with a 48, with a 40, 24, and 8 record. And, um, It's a steep, it's a very steep hill to climb for the Red Wings to catch up to those guys, as well as the Boston Bruins, the New York Islanders, the Lightning, the Panthers, and the new, and the new and then the New York Rangers. Streak by what the Pistons are doing, which I doubt. I only see them finishing as a team in the wild card spot, um, which means they're going to have to play. You know, like what they got, you got. I think what nine games or so left. So you got to play essentially. You got to play as if it was, it was an extended playoff series. That's how I see it. Yeah, I believe so. That's if you want to continue this ridiculous streak. Yeah, and get and then get knocked out of the out of the first round again. It's it's very. Uh, at least we made it. <laughs> get that, get that crap out of here. Woo-hoo. Yeah. Ah, oh, shut up, you idiot! What? Ah, oh. oh, shut up, you idiot! What? Oh. 
man, oh man. Yeah, it's that is so irrelevant, considering again, considering the the fact that we have this this uh, dump of a roster being ruined by uh, being polluted by the likes of Cronwall, uh, Nicholas Cronwall, Jonathan Erickson, Jimmy Howard, Kyle Quincy. By the way, Cronwall and Erickson, uh, I managed to catch highlights of the uh, Tampa game. My goodness, they were like sieves out there defensively. Cronwall was a mess. And pucks getting through. Cronwall was an amoeba. And Erickson was a minus four. A minus four. Oh my God, from your defenseman. That's beyond atrocious. That game. Oh man. Right out of hell. I mean, go, don't get me wrong. Howard deserved to get pulled, but his defense didn't do him any favors, as it showed later on for Morazic. 50-50 split. They, yeah, and they all suck. He freaking sucks. And, and we know we want Morazic to start more games than Jimmy Howard. Jeff Moss wants to wants to start Morazic if he were the head coach. I've been saying they should have start Morazic before the season started. Like, as soon as the playoff series against the Lightning ended, I said, this is Morazic's team to lose. And for some reason, Blaschel, you know, kept, you know, tap dancing around the issue and play, try to play games, mental games, or whatever the case may be. And really, it cost this team valuable points more than it should have early on. That's true, and uh, that's that's been uh, one one of the uh, disasters for the for this organization. Uh, and uh, Ken Holland is uh, still planning to keep uh, Cronwall and Erickson until their contra- until each of their contracts expire, and things like that. But uh, everybody knows that, so. Uh, Let's move on here to the Tigers here. That one is long gone. Tigers, uh, they had yesterday off after uh, getting walloped by the Blue Jays, the Toronto, the Toronto Blue Jays, 16-1 to in Lakeland at Joker Martin Stadium. Here's another text. Jimmy Howard for Vesna Trophy. <laughs> okay, I know he's trolling now. Yep. Ah, shut this, up, you this, idiot. This is from what? a different number. It, yeah, it's from, yeah, it is from BCAV. It's another number, but it's the same guy. <laughs> God. Hey, BCAV, your, your tricks are never going to work on me. We still got the show rolling. So shut up. Okay, Brian? You turd. Looking into the Tiger schedule here. They've lost two straight after uh, sweeping the split squad doubleheader on Sunday over the Braves and the Nationals. They came back with uh, four runs in the eighth to uh, beat the Nationals 7-6 to six in Lakeland. Yeah, how dare you insult Jimmy Howard. <laughs> I, I, I think Brian Kavanaugh is just joking with me. So wh- wh- why don't we just go ahead and uh, just ignore them. I'm not being fooled here. Tigers lost to the Phillies 4-3 on Monday in Lakeland, then they got destroyed by the Blue Jays 16-1. Blue Jays, uh, of course, have uh, have a very powerful offense. Yeah, Brian Kavanaugh is not joking. Oh, 
I'm going to text him back here. Spear will suspend him. He says he's not afraid of Spiro, but uh, Tigers have had yes had Wednesday off this Wednesday off. They play at uh, Florida Auto Exchange Stadium in Dundon, Florida. Yeah, uh, she, he's not afraid of Spear or me. He'll, he'll do whatever it takes to defend my favorite NHL player. <laughs> I, I told him, screw you. I mean, I, I admire his tenacity, but, you know. Oh, my God. I just keep... <laughs> yeah, we're, we're getting... We're, good. we're heading off the rails here. I think it's best to just keep focus on uh, what's, what's uh, the primary objective here. <laughs> Yeah, Brian Cavanaugh, please don't waste our time. We have a show to continue on with here. Oh, boy. But uh, moving on here to the uh, Daniel Norris thing, he uh, he uh, uh, suffered f- from back tightness, is what I heard, uh, ac- according to sources, multiple sources from the Free Press, the Score, uh, Bleacher Report, and Detroit Sports Nation. Uh, the statistics show from Detroit Sports Nation that uh, Norris had, had posted a 9.95 ERA in just six and a third innings of work this spring. Um, Daniel Norris. Uh, 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 some people on Twitter have said that uh, Shane Green may take over for Daniel Norris. Shane Green has an ERA of 263 in 13 and two-thirds innings this spring. Both both Green and Daniel Norris are competing for the number five starting pitching spot in the rotation. And uh, it looks like uh, Shane Green's going to win at all that that uh, number five spot at all costs, according to the stats and the status of the, the injury status of Daniel Norris's uh, back tightness. So uh, probably uh, probably I think we're uh, starting to see some improvements from Shane Green and uh, some regressing from Daniel Norris. Until that, uh, until his back got got so tight that he may not be able to move, Ed. Yeah, I mean it's it's great to see from for Shane Green's perspective, but uh, you know definitely a bit disappointing from from the perspective of Daniel Norris. I mean, let's not forget this past off season he already went through a lot uh, dealing with this thyroid cancer issue. Uh, he was able to overcome that successfully, but uh, you know it's now he's dealing with this latest issue with back tightness. I, I think you can tell it's. It's been a contributing factor to his uh, regression this spring so far. So if it comes to a situation where, hey, you're going to need one player to step up and take over, if Shane Green go right ahead, you know, uh, maybe you keep Norris and down in the minors a little bit, you know, so you, so you can have him uh, work his way out of not just uh, the funk that he's going on on the field, but just make sure work out whoever uh, uh, 
bodily issues or health issues that might be plaguing him and in turn plaguing his play uh, as well. So, Yeah, that's... Yeah, I, I, I would have to agree. So, uh, Daniel Norris is uh, apparently uh, not being able to... Uh, uh, not... Uh, uh, apparently uh, not going to be ready for opening day. Shane Green may uh, start. Hang on one second here. All right. Brad Osmus, uh, the manager of the Tigers, said, quote, we definitely need a s- to see a step forward from, from Norris today, and there's no question about that, unquote. It, and uh, Shane Brophy replied, it's safe to say that this was not the step forward that Osmus was looking for. Nothing is official yet on Daniel Norris, yet, but... Um, But uh, Daniel Norris ha- now has a steeper hill to climb to make the roster b- before the start of the regular season. Still no, still no expected time frame for a return. He only has two possible starts left for uh, left before opening day. He has not lasted more than two innings of any of his starts this spring. He has not lasted more than two innings of it uh, in any of his starts this spring. So um, that's about it for Daniel Norris. So uh, moving on to the Lions here. Touchdown, Detroit Lions! Remember, uh, for remember, people, keep your uh, content clean and uh, please share this podcast. Former Lions wide receiver Nate Burleson ha- has uh, encouraged. Uh, recently retired Lions wide receiver Calvin Johnson to come out of retirement and play for the New England Patriots. Now, we don't we all know 2 weeks ago Calvin Johnson has announced his retirement, but uh Nate Burleson was a Lions wideout. He's now an an analyst for the NFL Network. He doesn't and uh, Nate Burleson is uh, uh, apparently has felt too much pity for Calvin Johnson to see him not to see him retire without winning a Super Bowl championship, without a Super Bowl ring, without winning a Super Bowl ring. Uh, he said on NFL Network. Quote, now take this year off, then find a way to land with the New England Patriots and get a championship ring. You deserve it, unquote. But um, a source from Detroit Sports Nation, from Shea Brophy again, said that there's a problem with the strategy, though. Johnson's rights are, rights are still owed by the Lions. Should he decide to unretire, he would be... Tr- he would be property of Detroit at a cap hit of fifteen point nine six million in two thousand sixteen. If that would happen and the team could not afford the cap hit, however, they would likely to be forced to cut Johnson. At this point, it seems unlikely that Johnson comes out of retirement. He stated that he was at peace with his decision to walk away from football because uh 
his body was still in a lot of pain, taking a beating. And most importantly, he stayed loyal to the Lions since coming into the league, making it less likely that he would force the hand of the Lions at least this quickly. So uh, it appears that... uh, appears likely that Calvin will stay retired after this upcoming NFL regular season in 2016. The Lions uh, apparently will have to to move on from Calvin Johnson anyway. So uh, any thoughts on that, Ed? Uh, I think, you know, I, I do agree with the sentiment that you shared uh, right before you did start to delve into the article. Uh, well, I think what Nate Burleson was the spot he was coming from. He sees, you know, it was definitely him feeling bad for his former team. Because not only just his former team, I'm sure he has a, a good uh, good friendship with Calvin uh, outside of things as well. So it definitely made him feel bad to see a player of his caliber uh, retired, not only retired at early age, but retired without achieving the ultimate goal uh, that his talent you think would deserve. Um, so understand the reason, logic, try, hey, you know what, if you want to come out of retirement, try, especially, you know, why don't you find yourself a, a better alternative to what you were used to the past decade or so of your career? Um, you know, because it's, you know, it's in terms of mentality, culture, not to mention, especially coaching quarterback, there is a definitely upside uh, to playing for New England Patriots as opposed to the Detroit Lions. I mean, God's sakes, you got Tom Brady, enough said. Uh, but knowing the type of person Calvin is, you know, I think, you know, this is a tough decision for him to make. I think he's he's he's, he's at peace with it, like you said before. Um, and he also doesn't really need to see the need, you know, to put his body back on the line again because that was the one of them, not the primary reason why I decided to walk away from the game. So why would he come back, willingly come back, and put himself through all that hell again uh, for what, just a shot at, at, a, uh, at a future Hall of Famer? You know, it doesn't, it would be ice on the cake, but it doesn't necessarily need it. Dan Marino got to the Hall of Fame. He didn't have a ring. Barry Sanders got in. He didn't have a ring. There's a lot of great players in the Hall of Fame that don't have uh, championship rings. Not just football, but of course, all sports. Richard Miller, Charles Barkley, for example, in basketball. You know? So, um, Calvin Johnson does not need a, a ring to cement his legacy. His legacy has already been uh, stamped, sealed, and approved. So, for the sake of his body and for the sake of those around him, I would, I would rather he would stay out of, stay in retirement because he's already earned enough money. And he's such, you know, uh, in good favor with the Lions and, and their fans. You know, I think knowing the type of person that Calvin is, well, I'm not saying I know him personally, but from what you can see and convey how he displays himself, you know, it wouldn't, it would be very out of his character to do that, I would say. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I think I would disagree with uh, Nate Burleson's uh, p- opinion on Calvin Johnson. Um, uh, I, I, I think uh, it's it's best to, it's best for uh, Calvin to be safer than sorrier. Um, I mean, I, the risk is is the risk really worth the reward in this case? No, it's not worth his health. It's not worth his life. No. So uh, speaking of the Lions, going to the other topic, they have signed. They recently signed New York Jets. Wide receiver and punt returner Jeremy Curley, K E R L E Y. Curley got a four-year, sixteen million dollar extension from the from et, from then Jets general manager John Idzik during the 2004, 2014 season, according to Kimberly A. Martin on Twitter at Kmart underscore L I. Uh, Curley's best season was in 2012 when he caught 56 passes for 827 yards and two touchdowns. This past year, he had just 16 receptions, 152 receiving yards, and two touchdowns. His value came 
almost exclusively in the, re the return game as he returned an NFL high 48 punts for 411 yards. So uh, we're looking at a guy, a punt returner and a wide receiver uh, who, who can play wide receiver and punt returner that can fill in Jeremy Ross's cleats. Remember the Lions let Jeremy Ross go just just to uh, clear up cap space, to uh, to help clear clear up some cap, cap space. Uh, Stephen Tulloch is not released yet, but uh, back to uh, Curly. Uh, I, I think that's a good move for the Lions. Yeah, I mean, it, it's. I think it's uh, from terms of versatility. I think you built that quota, that status quo as well, um, and it gives you another uh, side weapon to look at. Um, as they already made the, the signing of Marvin Jones, now they had add in. Uh, this edition as well uh, could give you a sense of uh, how you know now with, with the departure of Calvin Johnson, not only does Detroit kind of trying to find different players, but they're trying to change the look overall of how their offense roll. Instead of relying too much on the deep ball uh, as you would have when you had Calvin, now you can say you know focus more on route running, short passes, quick slants, and not to mention utilizing some plays out of the backfield where you, you, you could potentially on some place stick Curly in the back in the backfield and use him or use him in the slot as part of your a jet sweep package or even a decoy perhaps. You know, you, you saw them try to use that a little bit with Stefan Logan and I could see them uh, doing the same thing here with Curly. And no I'm not talking three stooges. No. Of course not. So uh, going Going to uh, the final topic, which uh, has to do with Jim Harbaugh. Touchdown, Michigan! The head football coach of the Michigan Wolverines, he was uh, ripping Ohio State Buckeyes athletic director Gene Smith over a tattoo scandal on Twitter. Uh, Gene Smith uh, commented on Twitter on arch rival Michigan on Tuesday when he was asked about the Buckeyes potentially holding spring football practice in Florida like Wolverines head coach Jim Harbaugh did this year. Smith said, per Doug Lesmerizes of Cleveland of Cleveland.com, is it creative? Does it help from a recruiting and marketing point of view? Uh, quote, quote, unquote. I get that if we were jump starting our program, I'd probably try and try and uh, try and do that too. But we're not. But we're not jump starting our program. We're in a different place. Smith took to Twitter on Wednesday morning to apologize for his comments. Quote uh, on Twitter. Quote statement at OSU underscore AD. My comments on a soccer press conference yesterday were not meant to discredit our rival. I apologize to U of M student athletes and my good friend Ward Manuel. We at OSU look forward to continuing the the greatest rivalry in collegiate football. Prior to the apology, the uh, Harbaugh didn't let the comments go unanswered. And he took to social media to share this take to share his take on Tuesday. He said, "Quote: Good to see Director Smith being relevant again after the tattoo fiasco. Welcome back." The, tat oh. the tattoo scandal Harbaugh referenced is the one that shook the Ohio State football program in 2010 and 2011, and led to former head coach Jim Tressel's resignation, forced resignation. Smith caught plenty of criticism either, even within the Ohio State fan base at the time because he decided not to self-impose a bull ban during the 2000, a 2011 season in which the Buckeyes finished 6-7 and seven after an unceremonious Gator Bowl loss. The NCAA gave, then gave Ohio State a bull ban for, for, the, two, for the 2012 campaign which just so happened to be Urban Meyer's first year at the helm. The Buckeyes finished that season 12-0 and and could have theoretically played for a national championship 
but they were instead forced to watch the postseason at home. Many within Buckeye Nation were left wondering what could have been if Smith, what could have been if Smith had elected to to institute a self-imposed bowl ban the year before, even if there was no definite proof that would have saved the program from the same from the same fate in 2012. But but Ed, uh, this this hit, this has a lot to do with. Uh, this tattoo scandal has a lot to do with uh, Ohio State's ban- banning of of their uh, of a post of their postseason runs in 2010, 2011, and 2012, or just 2012. But um, Jim Harbaugh is digging up some history here, and. Uh, He's holding. He's uh, pointing the finger at Gene Smith, the athletic director, not the head coaches. You got to keep in mind, he's not blaming the coaches of the Ohio State Buckeyes. He's blaming the athletic director. So uh, it's not the head coach's fault. No, you know, but it, I just see this as an example of, uh, I guess, you know, from from Harbaugh's perspective, it's a friendly poke. Uh, for friendly rivalry jab, that's all it would be. Um, even Ezekiel Elliott um, had his response by just, you know, tweeting uh, in, re- in reply to Harbaugh, welcome to the big house coach, better luck next time, you know, a reference to the 42-13 smashing uh, that the Buckeyes handled to the Wolverines this past November. So that's all it is. It's nothing too serious to take away from it. But I will mention, though, it was quite an entertaining sight to see this this whole that whole entire debacle, uh, whether it be Trestle, whether it be Smith himself, or would have been, or even the school president himself, uh, stating you know it, when he was asked about whether he would whether or not he decided to fire Jim Trestle, he replied, and I quote, "I just I hope he doesn't fire me," you know that <laughs> that that said it all that was an entire micro that was a whole microcosm of how incredible and how much of a sideshow that whole entire scandal was yeah i believe so yeah that it's just uh the rivalry just keeps intes- intensifying and and just keeps staying hot it's it, it is the best rival in collegiate sports not just football but in basketball and hockey it, it carries on all other sports like baseball Softball, tennis. It's uh, it, they all it all it all around it, it all revolves around the football rivalry itself, which is the best in sports history. Well, some come close, you know, Lakers, Celtics, Yankees, Red Sox. Yeah, they, yeah, they do. Yeah, don't get me wrong. That's up there. Red Wings, Blackhawks, Red Wings, Maple Leafs, Red Wings, Avalanche. I'm going a little bit low here, but. Anyway, anyway, uh, the uh, the Cowboys and the and the Steelers, the Cowboys and the Redskins, uh, the the Lions and the Packers, <laughs> but, or Packers Bears, Packers Bears. Yep. Yes. Yeah, there are a lot more rivalries. Yeah. It goes without saying. True, that is true. Notre Dame versus everybody. But anyway, that that that's that's the last topic we covered. Now it's time for five questions. Let them rip, Taylor. Let them rip. And I've got some interesting ones too. It's time for five questions with Taylor the Gator Phillips. Question number one: Would the Pistons be better off with Carmelo Anthony on the team? I say yes from the standpoint of, well, you're getting a far better player than you would have gotten in Darko Milicic. So by, by, you know, by default, you're already getting a better team. But they've gotten more championships. That remains to be seen. You know, we can't really, you know, pick a time, like pick an alternative time portal or go to a mirror and watch what could have been, you know. It just doesn't work out that way. But I think they could have been at least a better team 
because uh, not only Carmelo's offensive scoring and versatility, but you also with you know since you had Lawyer Brown at the time uh, at that time of that draft, you could have instilled a sense of uh, team awareness and also a defensive skill play as well. Where, like I mentioned earlier, you would have seen a much much a vastly different uh, Carmelo than the one you see today. Absolutely, it doesn't have have anything to do with the the defense that the that the Pistons are lacking right now that they used to have with Ben Wallace, uh, Tayshon Prince, uh, uh, Chauncey Rashid. Billups, Rashid, and Rip Hamilton, Rashid Wallace. Yeah, but uh, Carmelo Anthony uh, would have been uh, a, another piece to fit in the puzzle for the Pistons. Next question. Question number two, shifting to the Red Wings, does Anthony Mantha still belong in the NHL with the Red Wings? I say yes. You know, he's a young player. You know, he's, he's some people have been... He's playing, playing well, to too. Him. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, down in Grand Rapids uh, in recent years. Uh, no, I wouldn't say in recent years, but months. yes, he's shown... A, yeah, months, I would say. Uh, yeah. He's showing good capability, and as, as described by Elite uh, pros, uh, eliteprospects.com you know he's a brilliant very good skater great speed so basically he's an even way better version of Darren Helm um, and he's a, he's a dangerous scorer so as well he's got a quick, quick release love to go along with good shots that's even nice to see so instead of the usual wind up that you see from some of these players you know just a, just a quick release that could sometimes catch the goaltender off guard it's very nice to see as well so and not to mention Size six foot five, you know, just over 200 pounds. He could grow into that frame and that height as well. So he could really use his size if need be uh, to, to create some havoc in front of the goaltender on power plays. So, and, and if you want to use a, a, a parallel comparison, think, uh, you know, Thomas Holmstrom in a way. So, yes, I definitely think he deserves the NHL and deserves to play for our wings. Yeah, we recall he got an assist. That's it. That was his first point in the NHL. Now he just needs to score a goal. Next question. Yep. It's a little bit more grit in, in his play. Yep. Question number three, are Jonathan Erickson and Nicholas Cronwall getting even worse on the ice as of right now? Uh, if that was even possible, then yes. Uh, and what you saw in, in tap was uh, sealed it. Uh, I've never seen defensemen play so loosely in almost all my time of watching hockey. It was just embarrassing to see uh, passes getting by and through so easily. You're letting players pass you by as if you're a sieve, an absolute sieve or a pylon out there. It was just uh, ugh, disgusting to, to witness. So, yes, they have, in fact, gotten worse. And what's even worse about that, we have these terrible contracts on them that you know any sane team with a rational GM would not take on. So, better or worse, we're stuck with these idiots. Yeah, but if only Ken Holland had a change of heart and just to see what the hell is going on on the ice with those two, <sighs> with Jeff Blaschel using those two mutts on the ice for way too long, especially on the power play and especially on the penalty kill. They had to face a five-on-three with Mrazek having no chance whatsoever of stopping that uh, that fourth goal for Tampa Bay. Uh, Riley Shahan uh, could have done a better job defensively covering that that uh, that doorstep player uh, scoring that fourth goal. Also, uh, Danny DeKaiser could have blocked that could have blocked that pass. Yeah, instead of just, you know, because the way he was positioned, the, the pass literally went through between his legs. So, not an upstart job, uh, upstart job the guys are defending that on that play either. Yeah, he, he's got he's to lay his entire body down, not, not just uh, stick out his legs like that. That's not the way you yeah. do it. Next question. Question number four, when Daniel Norris returns from his back tightness injury while Shane Green takes over the number five starting pitching spot in the rotation, should the Tigers play Norris in their bullpen or send him down? 
I would say send him down so to get uh, for him to get back ease back into um, uh, uh, the rhythm of things, uh, ease off the rust and find his rhythm regarding uh, finding his pitch and bring down his his ERA, whatever the case may be, or establishing he can uh, give you good innings and not have such a high uh, ERA or even a high WHIP uh, primarily before you bring him back up. Once he show once he showcases he's he's very productive, they can be quite adequate uh, down on the minors. Then you bring him back in for added depth, either in the bullpen or uh, in your starting lineup or your starting rotation rather. Yeah. Follow up question here: um, What if Shane Green does remain red hot through the start of the regular season, going into mid season, and Daniel Norris does heal up from from his rehab in Toledo? Do the Tigers put him in the bullpen then? Hey, I wouldn't mind it because what it gives you now. Now, if it comes down to a set where you need a fifth arm in there, whether it be you know it just sees from say Justin Verlander or. Again, regarding the health of Anibal Sanchez, has another guy you got to watch out for with health problems, another arm with health problems. So if it comes down to that, that's the only scenario I can see where they put Norris back in the lineup, even if uh, Shane Green was performing very well. You know, Green would stay in regardless, but if it, if, it, if it came down to where you needed an arm for depth in the starting rotation, okay, that's maybe where you could see Norris fitting in. But other than that, other than that, the way it's going, I'd rather just. Uh, if and when he gets brought back up, this point in the bullpen. That's all. Next question. Unless he's staying, with the, you know, staying up there uh, throughout the start and just going to make the opening day roster regardless. Right. Next question. Finally, question number five. This one's uh, a bit easier, but it still has to be answered. Is Calvin Johnson going to take Nate Burleson's advice and come out of retirement to play with the New England Patriots? No, as much as no. personally, as, as a part of me would love to see it, you know, again, it's it's just not needed. Just beyond unnecessary. Calvin has is, is, is already established a great legacy. He's already was, uh, he had, had been a fantastic player, a memorable career full of highlights. He's already earned his spot uh, in Canon Hall of Fame. You know, it would be, nice, yeah, be nice to see a player of his stature and of his character get rewarded with a championship. It's just not needed because it's not worth not worth it, and the risk is held yet again. But what if something were to go wrong in a, in a drastic measure? You know, he's on a, he's earned enough money where he, and he's he's at a spot where he can walk away from the game now, enjoy the wealth and enjoy the fruits of his labor, while they ever have to worry about oh my god, my what if my body starts uh, failing on me? You know, so it's it's just not needed at this point. Yep. And for all the listeners and fans out there, if you want to answer those questions, just replay the episode and answer them in the comment bank below this episode. That wraps up episode 207 of the Detroit Sports Truth. Ed, thanks so much again for your help. I'll talk to you either Saturday or Sunday or even Monday at 11 for episode 208. I, I will be in East. I may be in East Lansing on Saturday. Uh, I will be in East Lansing on Friday night for the state semifinals, maybe the state finals on Saturday. Uh, uh, what what sounds best to you, either Sunday or Monday? If I'm if I'm in East Lansing on Saturday, possibly Sunday, more than likely Sunday. We will keep you posted on on the uh, on the uh, upcoming uh, uh, on the uh, day and time for uh, episode two hundred eight. Thank thank thanks for uh, helping me out again, Ed. I'll talk to you uh, later on this this weekend. My pleasure, Taylor. Take care, my friend. And for Ed Smith, I'm Taylor Phillips. If there's anything you fans want more of or less of on our podcast, please let us know. We'll talk to you sometime later this weekend for episode 208 of the Detroit Sports Truth on Spreaker. TTFN Tata for now. Bon appétit.